Good afternoon. Good evening. Good welcome. How are you, Diane? How you doing? I'm well. How are you, Ben? I'm doing good. This is a big day. It's a big, big anniversary. It's really, yeah, this is our one year. We are one year old today. Yes. I didn't realize it, but I was looking up like great moments in rock history because obviously the first episode of Rock the Cash Bar, it's a great moment in rock history. I was looking up great moments in rock history for March 24th. Today is also the first anniversary of the first time that Mick Jagger and Keith Richards appeared on stage together. Whoa, what a, a yes. special day. What, what, mm -hmm. what show was it? They were doing a show together where they were called Little Boy Blue and the Blue Boys. <laughs> it's a funny uh, they were name. performing at a pub in London. I know it's a great name. <laughs> well, how special? How old were they? Oh, they must have been just kids. I Little don't know. I would kid. imagine. Yeah, they must have been just teenagers. <laughs> teenagers with floppy hair, like we were one year ago. We had the <laughs> whole world in front of us, and then it went away. It went episode away. 61, and we're doing a special one. We're doing our namesake episode. They're doing Rock the Casbah on Casbah. <laughs> fun, fun song. I absolutely, it's a weird song. Like, there's, there, it, it's, I forget how big a hit it is because I always, I, I tend, as big as the Clash are, I always tend to think of them as like somebody's little underground band. You forget that, that Rock the Cash, or the Rock the Casbah is in everybody's heart and soul. Yeah. Uh, but then the other thing about it is just like the circumstances of the, the way the song was written and how it ended up are, are just incredible to me. Rock the Casbah is one of the few Clash songs that was written by the drummer Topper Heaton. Usually Clash songs are, are scripted. The lyrics are done by, by Joe Strummer and the music was done by, by Mick Jones or some combination thereof. This one was, was Topper basically all by himself. Yeah. Uh, which is sort of the way he was in the band at that point because Topper was the guy. I mean, they were all doing drugs and drinking, but Topper loved his drugs, man. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like, yeah, Did they you? said that he is the one that kind of like, whipped this thing out musically like um what did it say he see joe strummer says that he was the real genius of the track he banged down the drum track then ran over to the piano and then the bass so it's like he just did it all himself yeah. and then wrote the original lyrics which are not the lyrics yeah. we know but yeah this was in like 1982 so the clash had been together for for four or five years at that point and they were beginning to wear on each other they were mad at each other all the time and uh, and topper was doing just an incredible amount of cocaine and heroin <laughs> so they weren't really like meeting in the studio very regularly they were on tour in america they were in new york and they had studio time so the guys would just sort of like show up at the studio they weren't showing up regularly so topper found himself in there alone and he starts playing he's originally a, 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 a pianist so he starts just banging away on this on this piano idea and that's where you get like that that sort of like it's like the happiest whorehouse in the old west <laughs> it's like the beginning yeah. of our podcast which chuck savage and eddie hawkins did <laughs> but he banged the whole thing out he did that he did the he did the piano he did the drums and he did the guitar and by the time the rest of the band came into the studio topper played this for them and they just went well that's just about perfect that's they great. laid in a couple of like other guitar parts and I didn't know this. I'd never even heard it. I went back and listened to it, and I couldn't really catch it. But apparently, there's a digital, there's a recording of uh, of Mick Jones's digital watch in the like at the one minute fifty two second mark or something of, of Rock the Casbah, and it plays uh, Dixie, the theme song from the Dukes of Hazard. Oh goddamn! I apparently, to yeah, I don't, right now. <laughs> like you've got to be kidding me! I've listened to this song a million times. I've never heard that, but evidently, oh. it's there. I'm gonna do I still that couldn't find it. Minute, but that's one of the. <laughs> One of my, like, the, the, the founding story of this song is, is, is Topper writes all the music and the band loves it It's because it's fantastic, it rocks, it's funky. Uh, but then he shows the, uh, Joe Strummer the lyrics that he wants to, to do and Joe Strummer just looks at the page, reads the lyrics. It's kind of like a soppy love song about Topper's girlfriend and Joe Strummer just crumples it up, throws it over his shoulder and goes, well, isn't that interesting, yeah? And then heads back over to the Iroquois Hotel to pen the lyrics to that we all know to Rock the Caswell. Well, it's funny that you call it a love song. From what I've read, Joe Strummer said it was a very, very, very pornographic ode to his girlfriend. Very, <laughs> very graphic and very nasty. And he's like, yeah, we're not 
we're not going to do that. <laughs> That's how coke heads express their love. Okay. <laughs> in no uncertain terms here's what i want to do specifically with the feelings you've given me <laughs> so okay i guess we should get into the lyrics and then take breaks and talk about it so joe wrote a very very different song and which i will say unfortunately growing up i didn't understand a goddamn word he was saying i even messed up the chorus <laughs> yeah I thought yeah, he was saying Cherie don't like it, like a woman named Cherie. For yeah. most of my life, I thought that's what he said. And then the rest of the lyrics, you can't even sing along to the song. Like if you don't know specifically what each line is, like I just kind of blew it off as a nonsensical song until yeah. like this week. <laughs> until, like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know what he's saying now. The cool guy who knew music that I worked with at, at Olive Garden when I was a teenager told me that Rock the Casbah was about Omar Sharif. And the Sharif don't like it is specifically about Omar Sharif. So I believe that for I many years. Okay. Yeah. But there were no, like, like, there, like you say, there were so many words in this song that I didn't understand. And like Joe Strummer's accent can get very thick. And of course they're using all kinds of words that I didn't know. So I looked this up when I was a, when I was a young man. So I kind of had it straight in my head. I wouldn't have had it straight if I hadn't looked it up. There's no way, there's no way as a dumb American from the South, you could understand this song as a teenager. Like, I would like to call this episode uh, Foreign Vocabulary Day on Rock the Cash Bar. <laughs> We're going to be Let's... inserting a lot of vocab words for you guys. <laughs> Let's get into it. This because there's, there's so many fun, okay, right, like right off the top, the first lyrics are, now the king told the boogeyman, you have to let that raga drop. I now know what that means. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you know the story behind the, the, the two? Their, their, the Clash's manager, uh, Bernie Rhodes, was mad at them at this point because they were writing all these really long sort of experimental songs. Like if you listen to, to like Combat Rock has Rock the Casbah and it has Should I Stay or Should I Go on it. Like the two most radio friendly Clash songs ever written. The rest of that album is crazy experimental and unbelievably weird just strange strange they bring in Allen Ginsberg to come on and just do just, just do a poetry slam in the <laughs> middle of a tune like it's bizarre yeah uh and fantastic it's my favorite Clash album but uh so Bernie Rhodes their manager told them just like it just all of your songs have to be like raga length yeah and I so didn't know what where... raga was so vocab <laughs> word I need like a little ding vocab word Raga, <laughs> melodic framework for improvisation and composition. Uh, they do it in like Indian music. And so what it translates to me in American is what we call jam band, like fish, where they just yeah. play and play and play. And you know, yeah. Yeah. Raga is very like yoga studio music. Yeah. It's definitely you have to like, like burning the right kind of candles, that sort of breathe deep, take yourself a yummy breath and right. listen to the Raga. <laughs> <laughs> The oil down the desert way has been shaking to the top. So I think he's getting a little weird. Like as, as the song progresses, I think you, you kind of sort of understand where what he's talking to there. It's like, obviously it, it, it's Arab imagery, mm -hmm. desert imagery. So he, he's establishing the oil, but he's also saying that the music that they're making is literally shaking the foundations yeah. of the earth. Yeah. So oil's coming to the top. The shake he drove his Cadillac. He went cruising down the vill. Ville, V I L L E, like the town. And then this is the, here's another, the Muezzin. 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 The Muezzin. Vo vocabulary Ding. word. A man who calls Muslims to prayer from the minaret of a mosque. Quickly, what is a minaret? I didn't know this. Most people probably know this. A tall, slender tower, typically part of a mosque, with a balcony from which the Muezzin <laughs> calls Muslims <laughs> to prayer. Got it? Continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the Muezzin, that must be the, and I did, but it must be that that we know from from the movies and the news, but that big like clarion call that goes out over the speakers, that must be the, the Muezzin, right. or at least that's what's going on in my head. If yeah. I'm wrong, hey, tweet at me, bro. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> the Shreef don't like it. Rock the Casbah. Wait, hold on. Did Rock. you say my favorite line on the radiator grill? Oh yeah, the Muezzin was a standing on the radiator grill. Sharif don't like it. 
trying to get like the raspy Joe Strummer thing going. It's I can't It's hard. Do it. No. I've been trying my whole life to get the raspy Joe Strummer thing going. I'm that kind of dipshit. Is that why you've been smoking this long? <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> I got to get that yawp. Um, I think most people know what a Sharif is. Quick vocab word. It's an Arab ruler. <laughs> yeah. I had to, I, I looked that one up. Like I, I always, in my head, it was just always as an Arab ruler, but apparently it's a, it's a very specific kind. And I, I read a little bit about it and I'm only going to fuck it up. But okay. I guess it, <laughs> I guess it goes to the heart of the difference between Sunni and Shia Muslims, which is not a difference I know anything about. I no. don't know anything about it, but I guess you can only be called Sharif if you're a descendant of a certain very important figure in Islamic history. Okay. Which is a name I can't even pronounce. But if you're if you're if you're descended from him, you're Sharif. If you're descended from somebody else, then you're then it's a different it's a different name. So That's... I don't know if the clash is using it entirely correctly, but obviously they intend it to be like he's the king, he's the ruler. Right. That's good enough for me, and I'm sure it's good enough for anybody listening. <laughs> <laughs> By order of the prophet, we ban that boogie sound. So I think uh I think the prophet has definitely got to be Muhammad. Like this is this is coming from the top people. No yeah. more boogie music. Degenerate the faithful with that crazy Casbah sound. But the Bedouin thing. Bedouin, nomadic desert dwelling Arab peoples of the Middle East and followers of Islam. Traditionally, they lived in tents, moving with their herds across vast areas in arid land in search of grazing areas. Bedouin society is, oh God, I didn't, patrilineal. They are renowned for their hospitality, honestly, and fierce independence. <laughs> That's what I love. Every article that I read about the Bedouins said that they said that they're known for their hospitality, which okay. is absolutely fantastic. You think of them like you think of like they're 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 sort of like 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 nomads. They're kind of fierce and 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 off on their own and living in tents, but also very happy to see you. Yeah, they'll share with you. Maybe good for trade. A little gypsy like, but they don't rob you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in. You ever had goat? <laughs> By order of the prophet, we ban that boogie sound. Degenerate the face with that crazy Casbah sound. But the Bedouin, they brought out the electric camel drum. I love the way Joe Strummer, like, like his lyrics just like, like they hit in this song particularly, they just seem to hit every beat. I don't know what to call it, but it's just like, yes. it's just so damn rhythmic the way he is uses it, words. I love it. Is it like cadence? Like the way he, he's singing matches the music, like the cadence matches up? I, mm -hmm. don't, I don't know. It's it, it's just absolute, like, because obviously like we know the music came before the lyrics. So he just, he just dropped it in perfectly syllable for syllable. It's amazing. Yeah. And it, and it all it just makes perfect. It doesn't seem like there's any filler in there. Like this this next line, the local guitar picker got his guitar picking thumb. Perfect. Like even when you like, obviously that's the, the song is ingrained in my head. But that sentence on its own, you can almost hear Topper hitting the drums. The guitar picker got his guitar picking thumb. Peter Pike, Piper picked a peck of pickle peppers. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as the sheriff had cleared the square, they began to wave. So the people are starting to party and the sheriff, as we know, Can't doesn't like, like it. it one bit. That's what makes this such a, such a rock and roll anthem. Like it's painted in the Arab world, which I don't understand much of. And I think Western eyes see it as you know, the, some of the most oppressive regimes in the world. And here's Joe Strummer saying that the power of rock and roll <laughs> could overthrow even this kind of strict behavior, even Music this sort freedom. of thing. Well, mm -hmm. at the time, uh, the Arab ruler in real life had put a ban on disco music and uh, was actually flogging people if they were caught with like a disco record or album or playing the music. It was pretty serious. Yeah, which, I mean, there were certain forces in America that would definitely, that would have done that in the disco era too. Yeah. You ever, you, you're a big baseball fan. You must know about uh, Disco Night at, uh, where was it, like Chicago or Philadelphia or something like that? Oh God, I'm sure Corbin does, but go ahead and tell uh, me. <laughs> that he did. I don't, it just, they, they had, uh, they had Disco Night and it was, uh, it turned into this, uh, if you bring your disco records, they were going to burn them or smash them. And you oh. got in for like a nickel or something like that if you brought a disco record to smash. And it just turned into this just bacchanal of just misplaced anger and rage from, two, you know, a two huge... Two questions. Yeah. What year, what stadium? I can't remember. I know it was, I, I'm pretty sure it was late 70s. And I want to say it was either Philadelphia or Chicago, but I'm not 
not Certainly. um atlanta <laughs> like this wasn't a southern no. thing wow no 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 this was this was east coast rage bubbling up this was this was and of course there, there's there's like you can read like whole long think piece articles on it about whether or not this is like an actual like people just hating something you know relatively harmless in pop culture like fuck i hate disco music or if the undercurrent was i hate blacks and gays oh god Ooh. yeah, yeah. I mean, because I so, could see it if they're like, come to numbers and burn a Cardi B CD. I'm like, that could be fun. No, that just shows how old I am. Nobody has CDs anymore. Like, there's nothing <laughs> physical to burn. Music is in the ether now. Yeah. <laughs> just come and shake a fist. <laughs> um, should I say, this might be the end of the vocab words. Should I just say what a Casbah is? Maybe should have yeah. done that off the top. Um, <laughs> Because I didn't know. I, I just didn't know. It refers to walled areas, castles, or a fortress in many North African towns, especially the one in Algiers. So, got it. It's got minarets. It's a castle. It's a fortress. A fortress. It's on the border. Got it. Yes. It's a building of authority. Yes. Uh, where were we? The Sharif don't like it. Now over at the temple. Oh, they really pack them in. The in crowd say it's cool to do this chanting thing. This chanting thing. But as the wind changed direction and the temple band took five, the crowd got a whiff of that crazy Casbah jive. It's part so of the temple. Hype. Yeah, they're at the temple. They're doing the, uh, the, the, the Jewish chanting. But even the Jewish people start to get the, uh, start to rock the Casbah. So they can yeah. start feeling the ground move beneath their feet as well. Yeah. As their temple band takes a break, the police catch a whiff of this crazy Casbah. Now, needless to say, the Sharif, not approving still not liking it no really looking at oh that stuffy sharif mm -mm. no dancing in the sharif's kasbah mm -mm. so the king called up his jet fighters and he said <laughs> you better earn your pay <laughs> <laughs> drop your bombs between the minarets down the kasbah way no shit and as soon as the sharif was chauffeured out of there again i mean just great lyrics <laughs> just, it's the mood as soon as the sharif was chauffeured out of there the jet pilots tuned to the cockpit radio blare. As soon as the sheriff was out of their hair, the jet pilots win. So the king's calling in his bomb squad to come and put down this rebellion, and the bomb squad themselves decide, no, this rocks. This no, they're rocks. They're cranking it up in their jet, and they're just like, nah, we're in the party. <laughs> Nothing about the king rocks. This rocks. And the sheriff, of course, didn't like it. He thinks it's not kosher. Is that a vocab word? I think we know kosher, right? We know kosher. Mm -hmm. Let's not dumb down our audience that much. If I know kosher, <laughs> they know kosher. <laughs> Fundamentally, he can't take it. That was the line that I had wrong my whole life. What did you I think? Thought it was, I thought it was, it wasn't not that far off. I thought it was, he's gone mental. He can't take it. That works. This works out right, but it's fundamentally he can't take it. And then my favorite part of the song is Strummer's big wail at the end. Of, you know he really hates it. <laughs> when I'm listening to this in my car on my own, I absolutely I stomp all over that line. Oh yeah. I scream it out. You know he really hates it. Oh, so good. Um, we As should interject because there's a lot we could talk about about the video itself. But I will say, go back and listen to episode 22 with guest Alice Berry, who was actually in this in video. video. <laughs> <laughs> and incredible. That was a fun moment. Like we're looking back over lately, like, like, like fun moments on our podcast. Having Alice on was fantastic because I was bringing her on because I knew that she was in the video and that's all that I knew. And I'd seen the video and I could confirm, okay, that looks like Alice 30 years ago. Uh, but then as we were talking, Sarah, you realized that she played in a band and she actually got to open for the clash and that, that blew my mind. Blew that my absolutely mind. Absolutely blew my mind. That's a great because episode. I had, no, I had known her for years at that point and just like, just, it just speaks to the humility that some people have. Like, cause if I open for the clash, it's the first and only thing you would ever hear from me. Everybody. Anytime. Hi, my name is, yeah, my name is Ben. I open for the clash. I open for the clash. <laughs> my name is Ben. <laughs> but I'm such a bragger. I would be even worse. My name is Diane. I opened for the clash and I was in the video rock the cash bar. Would you like to see a clip? It's always pulled up on my phone. Yeah. That's me right there. That's me. Hey, look, did your friend look, tell your friend to quit talking to her friend, turn around and look, that's me. I'm in the clash video. That's how annoying I am. <laughs> 
like we were saying, like, uh, so Topper writes this song in in the studio, and it's his, it's his piano line and 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 his guitar parts and everything like that. But Topper was on a downward spiral that would uh, it would lead him into some very very dark places. He was he, he got into to heroin and cocaine when he was on the road uh, touring in America. And he's got some strange quotes because like like the clash themselves were so serious minded and political. And they like like they make like Joe Strummer makes just grand, grand statements. Like he says, like, look, we're trying to be the greatest group in the world. And that means that also means being the biggest group in the world. So he wasn't apologizing for any of the commercial success that the the clash were having. He was pushing back against these critics that were saying, You guys are getting too big. How can you maintain the punk ethos this way? And he was saying, like, he literally, you know, at 25 or 26 years old, saying, I am trying to be in the biggest group in the world. So he's taking aim at, like, the Rolling Stones or whoever. Who was the biggest, really, Bruce Springsteen, whoever was the biggest band in the 80s. Joe Strummer had literally set his sights on him and said, we're taking the throne from you. That's weird. So not I, a shy guy. I have a little bit different research on that. Um, and who knows? But, okay, so I'm just going to read what I have here. With electronic sound effects and intriguing video, this appealed to Americans more than any other Clash song, but it wasn't a good representation of the band. For many young people in the US, the Clash were known as a British import with a catchy song similar to MTV darlings like Thomas Dolby and A Flock of Seagulls. In England, they were revered for breaking new ground as rock rebels. Um, but they were saying in America, we were just kind of seeing them as another British import. Um, when this song became a hit, Joe Strummer considered leaving the clash he couldn't justify singing rebellious songs when the band was rich and successful in their early years when they were struggling the music was sincere but he felt they were becoming a joke i don't know who wrote that i got that information off of song facts so i don't know if it's yeah. true you sound like you have a direct quote from him yeah it could it, and it could be that, that he just felt different ways at different times and, and gave different things to the interview but the, the the quote that i had was was like the writer was pushing him on exactly that like mm -hmm. how can you still claim to be this down and dirty you know punk rock kind of folk singer you know woody guthrie type if you've got all this money behind you you have a huge big record label and then joe Strummer said we've got loads of contradictions for you Mm, there's nice. There's I like nothing that. we can do about that. <laughs> well, this whole idea of getting too successful, it, uh, Corbin and I talk about it a lot with Rage Against the Machine and how, um, like, I fucking love that band. And so did Corbin. But at some point, they become so famous and, all, you know, they have all these anti-police songs, yet they're so big, they have to have a police escort everywhere they go. It started to get a little hypocritical. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do you handle that? I mean, that's bizarre. It's bizarre to think of. And I'm sure like like, like for a band like Rage and, and also for The Clash, like once you get to, once you start reaching a certain sized audience, you start, you're starting to reach people that you know aren't really hearing the songs the way that you intend it. Yep. You know, like there was a, uh, it wasn't like during the, the George Floyd protests, I could, there was a, a, like a video that was going viral of uh like like the back the blue crowd were were playing uh i think it was bulls on parade by yeah. rage against the machine right and like, like everybody's looking like are you even listening to that song have you read a single quote from those guys or, i want to do a whole episode on songs that are not what you think it means like fortunate son mm -hmm. and you know yeah but mm -hmm. also good music is good music like i have this funny idea in my head of like a the police escort at their concert, kind of like slowly shaking his head and jamming to killing in the name of. <laughs> Cause yeah. he's like, it's fucking jam. I can't help it. <laughs> he's like, I don't burn crosses. Like I'm one of the good guys. <laughs> so there, the, the, the Clash are in, in 82, one of the biggest bands in the world. And the other three guys in the Clash are actually working pretty hard at it. Like they're, they're you know, famously like learning different kinds of like Latin beats and Afro beats and, and different sorts of rhythms. And they're encouraging Topper to learn how to, how to drum reggae beats. And he's open to doing that, but he's also wanting to continue with his drugs. Yeah. There's a weird quote from him where he goes, I, I thought I was partying with the whole band, you know, like, like, like one night I'd be getting drunk with Mick. And then the next night, you know, me and Paul Simone would be hanging out. And then on another night, you know, I'd be having a couple of beers with Joe Strummer. He goes, I didn't realize that I was the only one who was there all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Like everybody else is just like, yeah, every third or fourth day, I, I, I tear myself apart a little bit. But, you know, 
but the topper was out there every single night. Like it. going two hundred percent, which you can only do on cocaine. Yeah, like to the point where it, it was it was building. Like, like he was he was as his addiction was getting worse and worse. Stranger and stranger things were were happening to him. And uh, like at one point, Joe Strummer pulled him aside and was like, "Look, you can't hang out with the road crew anymore. No hanging out with the roadies." And I'm like, "Well, why can't I hang out with the roadies? You guys don't want to hang out with me." And Joe Strummer told me because every time there's damage done. Yeah. The crew tells us, well, we was with Topper. Like, <laughs> the boss was here. We were doing like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, misery. But it gets, it gets pretty bad for him. Like he, he goes to rehab, you know, a number of times, the priory, as, as they call it. Uh, and obviously it doesn't, it doesn't take very well. They're on tour in, in Japan and he's going through a, a brief sober moment where they're like, they, they he literally he just can't find any drugs in Japan. So they give him an oxygen tank. So he does like the oxygen mask thing. So you can have like the big hit of pure oxygen to feel better. Yeah. And that works for one show. But for the next show, he just tears the mask off and he just has the oxygen tube just in his mouth. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Constantly <laughs> sucking on the oxygen tube in between like the oxygen tube and then smoking Oof. a cigarette and then Oof. oxygen tube and then smoking a cigarette. So he gets tackled out of nowhere, like like at a, at a sound check as he's, as he's doing this. One of the one of the like the Japanese members of the road crew like tackles him, pins him to the ground. A fight breaks out because one of the road crew has just attacked the band. So like the, the traveling road crew kind of comes over and they start, you know, beating on the Japanese guys. who have, And then finally, the, the story that I read said that through broken English, they were finally able to communicate like you're smoking in front of an open oxygen <laughs> tank. Explode, <laughs> explode. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to blow yourself up, which of course would have been the greatest rock and roll death ever. <laughs> oh, my God, that would have been. Oh, it's so brutal, but like so rock and roll gorgeous. Like this just explosion from the gun kit, from the uh, gun kit, from the drum kit. Oh my God. What happened to the clash? They exploded on stage in Tokyo. They literally exploded. <laughs> oh, they shouldn't have tackled them. No, 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 because they could have hurt the other guys. Oh, that's that's crazy. Yeah, a lot of people. It's just nuts. Really, like, just eye opening. It was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, how insane do you have to be to be smoking around one of those things? Let me tell you how it's insane. I went on one carnival cruise, one, it was a bachelorette party, and they have a casino in there. And I saw with my own eyes a little old lady with an oxygen tank cranking the slot machine, smoking a cigarette. Yeah. She could have blown up our fucking ship. And I was yeah. like, do I say something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's just adventure on the high seas. Oh my God. Oh my God. That was always my cynical, like knee jerk reaction. Every time you, you hear that a carnival cruise ship has shut down and it's turned into like the, uh, you know, the toilets are backing up and they're like, yeah, well, you wanted high seas adventure. You can't <laughs> scrub all the dirty pirate shit from the high seas. <laughs> it's always going to be out there. The sea is always angry. <laughs> no matter how many mickey mouse ears you put on it <laughs> oh so speaking, gets, sorry sorry let me butt in one more time because yeah. we're in that vein uh we were talking about songs being misunderstood this one was a big misunderstanding in 1991 the u.s military used this as a rallying cry when they invaded iraq in 91 uh during yeah. operation De desert storm they said mm -hmm. joe strummer was irate over the song being one of the most requested on the u.s in the u.s because of the misunderstanding that it was an anti-iraq sentiment uh, a similar fate befell the cure with killing an arab but yes. um He's like, this isn't an anti-Iraq song. It's just a song about musical freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his, that, that's a, I read stories that said that Joe Strummer wept because he heard that they that they'd written like "Rock the Casbah" on bombs that they were that they were yeah. dropping on Iraq, and obviously, like like that's just you know anything about Joe Strummer, you know that is not at all what he was about. Joe Strummer was raised by a, a British diplomat, so he grew up all over the world. He grew up in in West Germany, in Cairo, in in Mexico City, and this is you know like. In the in the '60s, after you know World War II, so the British Empire is is fully in decline, but it still has its stations all over the place. So right. I imagine that that's why why Joe Strummer turned into such a, a, a fist waving lefty was yeah. because he literally watched his dad try to exert Western power all over all of these different parts of the world. What an interesting upbringing. It would have been strange. That's one of my favorite things about Strummer is like every now and again, you see the picture crop up on the internet of him in his folky days, like before when he was uh, 
before he was playing with the 101ers and, and obviously before punk was a thing and before he was a punk rock god, he's got like the long 70s singer songwriter hair. He's got like the sheepskin jacket. Like he looks like James Taylor. And of course he's carrying around the acoustic guitar. I've and never I, seen know, this photo. You've got to look it up. Like, and it's, it's like all the, everybody always points to it and just like, see, even the clash were fake. Oh, <laughs> were, God, come on. It was all just an image. Like, yeah, nobody emerges fully formed, man. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't come out of your mother with a mohawk. <laughs> you got to yeah. build up to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all have different haircuts, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually did come out with a mohawk. I had really weird <laughs> hair when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of hair and it was sticking straight up all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so Topper's working his way around to getting fired from, from the clash. Like uh, he is either in Amsterdam for what he didn't, he didn't realize it, but Amsterdam was like the last chance that the band was given him. Like, okay, if you can't get his shit together, then, then we're going to get rid of him. So everybody is kind of like, like sober and on. You ever been in a situation like that where you're going to, like I've had it a couple of times at jobs where just like everybody knows that I'm going to get fired and I'm the last person to find out. Oh, that happened to you? <laughs> That's happened to me twice. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> and you can just sort of smell it. Like it's just like, it's just in the air. It's just the way everybody's treating you. It's like, what is it? Like something's severed. So apparently like he walks into the dressing room and he can feel that. Like it's just, it's very quiet. Everybody's getting ready for the show. So in order to perk himself up, he just immediately starts looking around for cocaine. So he's like, they're, they're going to fire him for doing drugs. And he's snorting generous rails off the mirror. Yeah, yeah, you might as well. He didn't know it was coming. And he, apparently he finds out in, uh, in the British music press because Joe Strummer, even though he's firing Topper for, for being on drugs, Strummer was drinking pretty heavily. So apparently he got drunk and was talking to a rock journalist and said, yeah, we're going to fire Topper. <laughs> and uh, they ran with it. And that's how he found out that he uh, got fired. Damn, heard it through the grapevine. Yeah, and that's what that was. It was right after he he'd written "Rock the Casbah," which went on like like they he wrote "Rock the Casbah." Joe Strummer writes the lyrics for it. They record it. They think it's you know one of the one of the best things that they've ever done, and it is. Uh, and then they fire Topper, and "Rock the Casbah" goes on to be their biggest hit in America. Biggest hit written yeah. all the music written by him. Yeah. Well, Topper is spiraling downwards and downwards and downwards. Like all he's doing is is shooting heroin and snorting cocaine. And he has a, obviously he has a very, very rough year. He's kind of down to, he, about a year after Topper got fired, Mick Jones got fired from the clash. So Joe Strummer is, he's eliminating the heads of the five families. He's consolidating his power. Or as Topper put it, you know, years later after he'd kind of, you know, forgiven him and, and, and gotten healthy again, Topper said that, uh, that Joe Strummer was firing everybody from the band because he didn't have the guts to leave himself. Aww. Like he, like really what it was is Strummer didn't like the direction the clash was headed in. So he should have left and then it would have been all right. But right. I guess he just didn't see it that way. He saw it as his thing. So the rest of you can <laughs> jog on. Yeah. So he fires Mick Jones and Mick Jones immediately goes to find, uh, to find uh, Topper and asks him to join his new band, uh, which went on to become Big Audio Dynamite. Great Big band. Audio. Oh, they have a song called... Uh... That la la lions, lions in the jungle. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, I love Big Audio Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> and they love you right back. Mm. But here's the bad, like, like, so the Clash are fighting with their record label and fighting with their manager and fighting with each other and everything like that. So all of their paychecks and everything like that have been delayed. So as they're forming Big Audio Dynamite, uh, Mick Jones and, and uh, Topper end up getting a huge big royalty check. It was worth some 750,000 pounds in today's money. And it's just all one check. Here you go. So Topper's a drug addict. You can't give three quarters of a million pounds to a drug addict and not expect bad things to happen. So the money's gone in a year and a half. And oh, over that year and a half, no. he's like, he bought, you know, a, a nice apartment and a you know, nice car and everything like that. But as the money starts to, starts to go away, everything in his house, like his dealer would come over every single day because you've got you know the, the rock star on your list. That's where you're, so he would come over and if there was cash, he paid cash. If not, it was just like, okay, I'll take that rug. Mm -hmm. So the dealer would walk out with a rug. He'd walk out with a TV, he'd walk out with a couch. And eventually Topper was left sitting on the floor with a black and white TV, nothing to keep him company, but his drug addiction. So what is one of the biggest rock stars in the world and keep in mind, he was one of the biggest rock stars in the world 18 months prior. Like, you're like it's a blink of an eye. Yeah. He starts driving a cab in London. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. And not even like, a, cause like, I don't know if you know this, but, but in order to drive a cab in London, like you have to be like legendarily smart. Like the, the test to be a cab driver in London is crazy. Cause you have to like, there, it's medieval streets. Cause like, it's, it's no just, grid. There's no grid. It's just all higgledy piggledy and all over the place. And it's not first street through second street through third street. Like it's, they're all named different things. They're different roads intersecting everywhere. So in order to be like a properly licensed London cabbie, you have to go through this incredibly rigorous. He didn't go through that. He's a drug addict. So he's driving a gypsy cab that barely starts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, literally, he keeps a broom in the cab. And anytime somebody gets into the cab, he has to hand them the broom and they have to like beat on the top of the battery in order to get the cab to oh, start. God. <laughs> it's like, yeah, before you get in, you smack the hood. <laughs> <laughs> it's teamwork. Teamwork makes yeah. teamwork. <laughs> but apparently because he's a drug addict, he would only drive the cab for as long as it took him to get his to get the drug money that he needed that day. So mm -hmm. just for years, he's just driving a cab, making 25 pounds a day, and then going and buying, buying heroin, and just like slowly and slowly, slowly devolving. And of course, while this is happening, Rock the Casbah is one of the biggest hits ever. Like he's just missing out on all of that money. Like I can't imagine what it would be like to, to I mean, obviously I'm broke. I would like money very as badly as anybody, but to have a monkey on your back while you're doing it and to understand that the only reason you aren't incredibly wealthy right now is because you fucked it up. That's the power of good drugs, like cocaine mm -hmm. and heroin. Like it puts your, uh, it messes with your brain to where you're like, ah, the consequence is worth the risk. I just really like the way I feel right now. It's dangerous. <laughs> I, I'm glad because I didn't follow up. I heard you say earlier, he's clean now. This sounds like a dead end story. Someone who's this bad off usually doesn't climb back up. No, and, and, and he, was, he was down for a long time. Like he didn't get clean, I think until, until the late nineties uh, or, or maybe even later. Like Joe Strummer died in, in around Christmas time, 2002. And, yeah. and I, don't, I don't think I read that that was the inspiration for Topper to get clean. I think he was clean kind of just prior to that. Mm. Uh, but Topper freely admits is just like it, it shouldn't have been Joe, you know, by all rights, if any one of us had to had to die, it really should have been me. I mean, right. I was the one who was doing all the damage to myself. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a weird, like, you can't help but feel like that's not right. I mean, Joe just had a heart attack at like what 50 or something. And yeah. this guy was damaging his body on purpose for years and nothing. <laughs> mm hmm. And the Clash were just about to get back together too, or so rumor had it. They were going to oh, really? reunite to, yeah, they were going to reunite to play the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. Ay, ay, ay. Mm-hmm. And it, did you see the, uh, I think, I think was it the Grammys or was it that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the, the, the super famous quartet that came together to, uh, to induct? Yes. Is that the one? Hold on. I may be mixing up stories, but is that the we one? We talked about it before. It's Elvis Costello, Prince? Bruce Springsteen. No, I don't think Prince. Oh, think okay. That, yeah. I, I think it's Costello, Springsteen, Dave Grohl on drums, if I remember right. And I can't, oh my God, I'm going to be mad at myself. Well, what's the one that I'm else. talking about where all of them are playing their instruments and then Prince comes out and just lays them all flat? I can't remember. So that was... That was George Harrison's uh, Well, My Guitar Gently Weeps. That's right. Uh, that was, okay, that's yeah. what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite things to watch because I don't really know how music works, but I know a little bit about how live performance works. And I swear, if you're, if you're watching that, like, they didn't rehearse it like that. Like, it must no. have been just like, okay, we're going to let Prince do the guitar solo, and he's going to do his version of the guitar solo from Well, My Guitar Gently Weeps. And you can just see Prince, like, digging into it. He does, like, probably 16 measures more than anybody was expecting. But it's because like, like because they're musicians and they're pros, they're just looking at each other like, just let Prince cook. Just this let him this is it. great. Just let him go. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> moment. I, rock stars are like Catholics. They may lapse, but they're still rock stars. <laughs> that's what somebody said of, of uh, one of Topper's <laughs> friends. <laughs> Not even talking about his drug relapses, but no, it's still in him. It's, it's <laughs> Oh, I like that. That's a good quote. <laughs> well, that's Rock the Casbah, I think. I think so. I think that's all I got, too. Um, you know, we talked. We did London Calling on episode 22, and we talked so much about just the clash. And then, like I said, we talked about this video because Alice was in it. Um, I, I wonder if we ever do another clash episode, if we'll have anything left to say. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to table them for another 60 episodes. No yeah. coming back to the clash for at least another 60. 
Yeah, maybe so. Um, all right. Well, this might be a really fun place to put in uh, for us to watch Six Degrees of Tommy Stinson with Jeremy Essig. He did a very special one for our anniversary episode, and I'm going to be quite embarrassed. So let me pull out my <laughs> headphones and we'll watch this together. Hey, friends, welcome to the anniversary edition of Six Degrees of Tommy Stinson, where we're celebrating one year of Rock the Cash Bar. And while I was unable to find party hats, what's a party without cake? Specifically, a Corey Haim cake. <laughs> yes, that is a young Diane celebrating her birthday with a Corey Haim cake. And since we already tangentially connected Tommy Stinson to The Clash on the Blur episode, why not connect Tommy Stinson to young Diane's cake centerpiece? Corey Haim. Did you know Corey Haim made a Europop single in 1994? Neither did anyone else. Yet, You Give Me Everything exists. Well, sort of. The song is listed as unreleased, yet copies of the CD Maxi single can be found on Discogs for about $50, and a mix of the song can also be found on YouTube. That said, it remains strangely unlisted on allmusic.com, and the song's two producers, Daniel Gonshurik and Daniel Schubert, are also unlisted on all music, which is even more odd considering the site is a clearinghouse for music info and frequently used when I can't do these segments from memory. So, where to go when you can't find the answers on all music? Well, German Wikipedia, of course. Yes, that is the only place I could find info about the group Caballero, one of the only other listed production credits for Gronschek, whose name I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong. So, after a quick run through Google Translate... It seems that Caballero was best known for their covers of British new wave band Ultravox, whose second guitarist, Robin Simon, also played in the band Magazine. A supergroup of sorts formed by the Buzzcocks Howard DeVoto and featured drummer Martin Jackson. Jackson went on to drum with the Derudi Column, a band I learned about during the recording of the first edition of this segment because their guitarist Vinnie Riley had collaborated with Baltimore-based electronic musician B.T., who featured bass on his 2003 album Emotional Technology from Tommy Stinson. So, from Corey Haim Birthday Cake, to German Wikipedia, to Ultravox, to Magazine, to Vinnie Riley, to BT, and back to Tommy Stinson. And, since no anniversary is complete without a present, I will be coming to Houston sometime soon to do a show where post-vaccinated Ben, Diane, and myself are all in the same room. So, Ben, Diane, thank you for letting me be part of this great show. Thanks for doing it every week, and congratulations on one year. See y'all soon. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> you had a Corey Haim birthday cake? Oh, Ben, let's get back to you. <laughs> okay, that was Diane at 11 years old, and that was fifth grade and my mom got me it's like I torn out of a bop magazine Corey Haim's face airbrushed in icing on the top of my cake <laughs> <laughs> you should see like when we start to cut it all the little girls are calling out which part of his face they want like obviously it's my birthday I get the lips but everybody else you can hear them they're like I want an eye I want an eye give me his nose I want an ear <laughs> 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 psychopathic little girls <laughs> oh god so in a conversation we we're talking about how quickly like my musical tastes changed as i'm like entering into puberty like every every little girl my age started with new kids on the block so the posters on my wall went new kids on the block and then quickly to um oh it, no 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 it went Corey Haim, new kids on the block for a second, it went to Bon Jovi before I tore all that down and went straight Robert Smith from The Cure all over the place. <laughs> yeah. But there's this really psychotic story about like at some point, Bon Jovi's poster was on my wall and someone somewhere said a rumor that he was gay. Whereas I have zero problem with homosexuality. I had a problem with the idea that he would never love me. So I took a <laughs> safety pin and opened it up and stabbed my poster right in his dick. <laughs> like, oh, right. <laughs> like I was mad. I think I was 10 or 11 and I was fucking mad that he would never love me because he loved men. Um, so this is before I started my menstrual cycle. So it's not even, <laughs> it's not even hormones. Bitches be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so embarrassing. Corey what about Hame you? Never let you down like that. 
Uh, I had a Christina Applegate poster on my wall. Christina Applegate, uh, Kelly from uh, Kelly Bundy. I had a picture of her looking like all rock girl hot, like ripped jeans and then like a leather like bikini or, or halter top or something like that. Yeah. I had that on my wall for a long, long time. That's a strong choice because you know what? I bet you could get a picture of her right now, the age she is right now in that same outfit and it would still work. Like she has- Still looking just as good. She has maintained hotness, man. She has not <laughs> gone down at all. Corey Haim, on the other hand, he went the way of a uh, topper, but not, yeah. not successfully. Mm -hmm poor guy we're gonna miss him like i say he never would have disappointed you you should have just stuck it out with Corey hayden no, you no. could have saved him i could have i could have that's mm -hmm. what every 10 year old thinks i'm gonna save him from heroin oh he had a he had a lot in his history there's no way i could have saved him uh let's not get depressed though let's get on to dressed up like a douche this week from instagram and our little uh I say little, I don't know who she is, but she she's always liking our posts and I love her for it. Uh, Emmy Wrigley. Um, she's actually tattletailing on a friend with two songs. Uh, she had a friend who thought Prince's Raspberry Beret was Raspberry Parfait. <laughs> Sounds delicious right now, actually. Mm -hmm. And then another food one, the same friend, instead of hearing Amadeus, I think we've had this one before, heard mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes, <laughs> mashed, mashed potatoes. potatoes, mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes, much better song. I think her friend was just always hungry. That's what I'm <laughs> gathering. <laughs> Don't forget to eat your vegetables. All right. Guess what we get to do right now? What am What's I that? doing? Oh, we get to draw. Uh, we get to draw a name for April's Patreon. Actually, did you ever ask Jeff Lewis if we did a good job with the kinks? Did he? Yeah, he liked it. He liked it. He had a really good time with it. Good. Corbin said the same. <laughs> Speaking of Corbin, he already told me if we draw his name, what song it's going to be. So let's all pray right now. Do not draw Corbin's name. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Drawing it live. Not looking. Jim Costello. Do you know Jim? I know Dr. Costello. All yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. We are going to contact Jim and find out which song we are doing from Jim in April. So I'm excited about that. Uh, all right. Next week, we will be joined by the wonderful and hilarious Billy D. Washington. And he has chosen to cover Cult of Personality by Living Color, which Whoa. is one of Jeremy Essig's all-time favorite songs. So this mm. should be good. That does sound good. Billy's very funny, and I almost always call him Billy D. Williams. Always. I have to tell myself, it is Washington, it is Washington. When I first started at Open Mics, uh, Billy D. was one of the one of the strongest comedians there. And I was always just like, like, like 18 year old me just backstage, just like, it's Billy D. Washington, it's Billy D. Washington. Don't say Billy D. Williams, don't say nope. Billy D. Williams. I was at an open mic a couple of weeks ago, and some poor kid in the exact same situation dropped the ball and said oh. Billy D. Williams. And my heart went out to her. I was just like, oh, it could have been me. <laughs> Does Billy take it well? Is he just like, oh, yeah. yeah. He totally understands. He's fine with it. I'm sure it's not the first time it's happened to him. It won't be the last. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to make sure we call him Billy D. Washington next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was fun. Happy one year anniversary. Happy one year anniversary, Ben. <gasps> Boom. Uh.